look at those grain lines, I'm in love. I'm a collector. I, I struggle with curation, of course, because uh, I, 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 I have been called a hoarder in the past. And uh, part of that is I'm, I'm always looking at things. And a, a prime motivation is not the having, it's not the owning, it is uh, what I get from the things. It is the inspiration. It is uh, how was this made? Why was this made? What was this material? Um, and how can I take that inspiration, take that material, take that design idea or ethos or plan or motivation? How can I take that and put that into something that I make? I was rummaging around. Hey, we're in my partially complete new home studio workshop. I'm not even sure this is a corner of my lounge now, which is, hey, dream come true. And I was rummaging around looking for nuts. I found a few uh, aluminium bits and pieces that I've had and uh, that I had made in the past and that have come off for various reasons. Obviously, the standard boring fair bone. Uh, I have some uh, antique ivory that came off uh, some furniture, you know, bits and pieces. This is my guitar. I can do what I want with this. I am going to make a solid mother of pearl nut for this guitar. It is going to sound, I assume, brighter than ivory or bone or mammoth ivory, etc. Uh, it is not going to sound quite as bright as the frets themselves. So to answer that question straight away, uh, it will be a little bit more shimmery, a little bit more responsive. And uh, we have an instrument that is made out of a fence post and it is mahogany and it's going to be warm anyway. So anything I can do to mold that sound, uh, well, it's a good thing. There we go. This is yet another interstitial episode in the hand tool only build. And I'm going to make a mother of pearl nut because why not? Let me know in the comments, why not? Seriously, am I missing something? So this has some barely visible in this shot grain lines going through kind of like ivory and an incredible uh, amount of color and uh, it is it would be a pity if I didn't use this uh, bit of carving at the end of this uh, knife handle uh, somewhere so mother of pearl has been used for all sorts of stuff this is a, um, a silver plated fruit knife and uh, it's got a lovely thin piece and you can pick these things up all over the place this is a uh, silver, a silver bladed uh, pen knife that uh, was carried in your pocket uh, to to cut up citrus uh, because the acid in the citrus doesn't corrode the silver. Here's another one. I need to at some point <laughs> fix that pin. But um, you can find lovely things like this all over the place. Uh, knives, cutlery, uh, all the way up to and including um, incredible art. This is hand painted uh, onto a piece of Mother of Pearl. And uh, it's just incredibly detailed. This is one of my favorite things uh, signed by the artist. If anybody knows anything about this, let me know. I mean, look at that giant thing. Uh, Black Mother of Pearl found in a box of buttons. And uh, you can go around uh, charity shops and gift aid places, <laughs> gift aid places, charity shops and auction houses and antique centers and things. And you can find stuff like this uh, all the time, uh, up to and including these gorgeous things, which are um, hard to focus on. But these are little engraved mother of pearl uh, Chinese gaming tokens. Now, many times I feel conflicted 
and I don't really want to cut up this, uh, this material that I've found for basically no money whatsoever uh, in comparison to what I would have to spend for, for the raw, you know, for the raw material. But um, also, as is the case with these, that emblem in the middle of a guitar, if I'm able to focus on it, that in and of itself is just really cool. And these could be used and utilized uh, as, a, as a valid bit of decoration on a guitar. And this sort of thing isn't necessarily the best use of one's time. It isn't necessarily the most cost effective. Yeah, I could buy, I, hell, crimson guitars. We sell pre-cut inlays in many different shapes, birds and trapezoids and all that jazz. But that's boring. I would rather, I would rather play around. But that is me feeding my need for newness, for new projects, for new challenges. Uh, yeah. As I was putting this away, I noticed the unnecessarily beautiful engraved detail on the back of this, uh, this knife. And this is the sort of thing that uh, I love. We appear to have lost the love for the thing. We've, uh, we've lost uh, the pride to a certain extent in what we consume. We will buy IKEA furniture because it's supposed to be easy. Uh, that stuff falls apart in three years and it is as utilitarian as it is possible to be. I will buy a thing that needs to be refinished at this point, got caught in the rain, a um, 150 year old bit of mahogany furniture for a minuscule percentage of what it's actually worth that is gonna last another 500 years or a thousand years because it is so well made. Whereas that Ikea chest of drawers is gonna be dead and gone within six months or a year. This is a confusing little clamp contraption, but I don't have anything else here right now. I'm gonna chop this little end piece off. I wanna use it as decoration somewhere. Yes, I need to get a mini extractor or hoover or something like that. But this is the hand tool only build um, and a dust mask. This stuff's not safe. Don't breathe it. There is, as I'm sure many of you have realized, a hole for a tang. I am hoping that that doesn't go too deep. I don't really want to check, I want to find out naturally. Uh, but even if that does go through the middle of the nut, I'm not too worried about that. This material is so, so hard and so beautiful. This is one of the uh, new lower profile, uh, medium size crimson sanding sticks. These things are fantastic. Like, genuinely one of those useful tools that we make at Crimson. I suspect you've already watched more than enough of this process. 
So suffice to say, I'm going to carry on going <laughs> with the hand tools. Uh, I don't actually have grinders and things like that here. And I'm going to square off the rest of this blank. I'm leaving the whole thing rather massive, uh, wondering if <laughs> wondering if I have got enough to also make the saddle out of the same piece, uh, or maybe individual mini Mother of Pearl saddles. Who knows? We'll see. I'm leaving my options open. You guys were hearing the audio from the camera's inbuilt microphones because well, I am not used to this system and completely forgot to actually plug the microphone in to the camera. Not only that, uh, not only that, but I was wearing the camera's receiver and the camera was wearing the microphone. Yeah, some hiccups filming at home. You still heard what was going on, it's all right. I'm sorry. There'll be a small hole in the end, I think, but not much. Luthiers use files, engineers' files, far more often than pretty much any branch of woodworking that I know. And uh, in fact, a lot of woodworkers are fairly snooty about files. These things are incredibly useful, but a lot of people don't actually know how to use them properly. And I take this sort of stuff for granted. I'm just standing here zoning out because this mother of pearl is so hard, this is taking quite some time. And I thought, hey, watch this. Received wisdom is that you should only push with a file. Uh, rasps, I get it, probably. Files, less so. Uh, most people will push and then lift up lightly, keeping contact with what you are filing. This is not damaging the teeth. Uh, there's been some pretty freaking cool uh, video is done on the subject actually. I'm pushing down as I go forward, lifting off but keeping contact. If you're doing this, uh, you have a lot less control. If you angle the file, suddenly I am, instead of having that much contact, if I've got the file at an angle, suddenly I've got and all of that, that I didn't have before. And therefore, uh, I'm keeping the file a lot flatter as I go. And what I'm getting out of that is a surface that is almost already perfectly flat. If I'm teaching you to suck eggs, I'm truly sorry, but uh, at least one person uh, needed at least one of those little bits of information. Anyhow, nearly there. Oh, so the truss rod is sticking up just a little bit. And uh, this calls for another file, this time a tiny little jeweler's riffler file. A pencil cut in half or planed in half or whatever is an absolute godsend of a tool. Run flat along the top of the frets. That gives you the height of the fret, which is the absolute lowest point, or basically the point that you want to aim for, uh, for 
the bottom of your string slot channel. And then I do have a design for a tool that will uh, mark both of those lines in one that we need to make. I'm not putting very much pressure on this. This is a 14 TPI blade, but it's still very coarse in comparison to what we've got going on here. Okay, so I could take a jeweler's saw and cut that whole thing off to save the material, but I'm not gonna. I am thoroughly enjoying this. The, uh, it's night time, there's uh, a lack of natural light. So I'm going to finish this process in the morning. But uh, before I do that, uh, it's incredibly important to round the edges uh, where your hand, where the palm of your hand is gonna touch the nut and make that as round and as comfortable as possible. We had, we, we delivered a custom guitar uh, to a client today and we got an immediate email back saying that this person who had uh, multiple high-end factory-made guitars hadn't realized the, the difference that is made uh, when a luthier goes through and builds a guitar because it's, it's not about the neck joint or the wood choice and all of that. PRS et al do that very well. It is about that level of detail. It is about how the frets are rounded over. It is about how the fretboard feels. It's about the, the custom shape of the neck, etc. And uh, it does make a huge difference. And this is one of those things. If you had a guitar from us that had this done, uh, you wouldn't necessarily notice that it had been done because it was inoffensive, because it is made to not be noticed. It's very important that the nut seats square, and that currently isn't. You see how I'm pushing it down? Uh, there's crap in the corner there. Now, but I will fit that absolutely perfectly, polish it up, and mark and cut the fresh slots in the morning. Shiny fun. With natural light, or more light, and uh, more importantly, a set of uh, nail buffers, I think they are. These things are damned useful. Uh, I have got something close to perfection. Okay, so important question. I have got a hole in the end of my nut here and uh, before I go any further with this I want to know from you guys should I either fill it with a hollow silver tube or a solid chunk of silver or potentially uh, if you really want me to just go crazy I could drill it out a little bit more and install a cubic zirconia uh, or a bit of ruby or something something fun like that just because you know i have no self-control okay so find the pinned comment uh, below and answer me this in the hole at the end of the nut should i install a hollow uh, sterling silver tube 
should I melt down and uh, create a solid chunk of, uh, of silver to go in there? Uh, or should I potentially, uh, inside a hollow silver tube, install a cubic zirconia or something like that? Uh, let me know, I will do that in the next, uh, in the next video. I'm also not going to mark out the, uh, the string spacing, etc. Before I do that, I would actually very much like to prototype a, a tool to replace the half pencil. Uh, so, yeah, if you'd like to see that, also let me know in the comments. The top doesn't have the same chatoyance, but, but it's got grain. It's got grain lines like, like ivory. Yeah. Uh, thank you for watching. Click like, subscribe, uh, ignore the mess behind me. Uh, you guys are absolutely incredible. And thank you for facilitating my life and putting up with all of the chaos that has been going on uh, of late. Thank you. I'll see you soon. Goodbye. Postscript. Should I make a nut out of semi-precious stones, sort of agate and things like that? crystal knot.